Hi, everyone. So I, I want to start talking about Heidegger today. Um, but Heidegger is such a complex thinker, and it's important also to keep in mind that uh, Heidegger specifically addresses the idea that he is not an existentialist. So of the three people that we've studied so far, existentialism wasn't a thing for two of them. And one of them says, that ain't me. So, you know, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, they, they predate the, like, the idea and the term existentialism. So it's an anachronism to apply it to them. Although it might be justly applied, it's still, you know, it's before they were around to sort of be that. Um, anyway, <clears throat> Heidegger, they asked, there's a letter that's asked, that sent to Heidegger, an open letter. Uh, we're we're going to read it. Uh, or Heidegger's response. And the, the question is, you know, Heidegger, are you a humanist? Is existentialism a humanism? And are you an existentialist? Uh, so are you a humanist? Uh, asking, saying the same thing kind of thing. Are you a humanist uh, because you're an existentialist? So forth like this. And this is like because of the last guy we're going to read, who is uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. So because of Sartre's understanding of existentialism as a humanism, this letter gets addressed to, to Heidegger, and he responds in the letter on humanism. So we'll read that at the end. We have to have a good bit of Heidegger under our belt for that to even sort of make sense to us. So... Um, Heidegger, the existentialist who denied it. You know, just though, however, as one would say, you know, it's appropriate in some senses to call Kierkegaard an existentialist, even though he wasn't around for the term. And it's appropriate in some way to call Nietzsche an existentialist, even though he wasn't around for the term. It's also appropriate to call Heidegger an existentialist, even though he denies it of himself. Um, we'll see why. It is a... It is about, you know, the attentiveness to lived experience as, like, the source of meaning and uh, the source of my being and, and for the, uh, the understanding of the meaning of my being. So, um, like with, with Kierkegaard's constant choice, you know, that constant resolve to choose, that puts me constantly in the, in the, in the moment. I mean, Nietzsche's eternal return. Is, a, is to bring me back to this moment, right? To make, make this moment not about, not about the value that's at the end, not about a goal, but about now. So Heidegger is going to, well, I don't know if he borrows from them. I guess he, we could say he does. Uh, th this idea of a, of like sort of in the moment as, versus being just, toward the trajectory. So when we get a little bit more Heidegger under our belts, we're going to understand this idea of Galassenheit, which is a letting go. Um, uh, uh, yeah, letting go. And it, it might be with this idea that Heidegger has something similar to Buddhism. I think that if you were to go to the library, you would find a whole bunch of books, uh, well, a few at least, where uh, Heidegger and Buddhism are associated is probably around this kind of an idea, um, although there might be other ideas as well. Uh, a Galassenheit, a releasement, a letting go. Another way of he that Heidegger addresses that is living without the why. Now, you think of Kierkegaard where, you know, this commitment to something that's like a, an absurd thing to commit to, right? Without the why. I mean, and Nietzsche, you know, may, uh, the horizons are dark, but they're our own. You know, we don't know what's coming, but at least we've chosen this on purpose. You know, so Heidegger is going to have something like that as well going on. Um, what else does he have? Uh, oh, from Nietzsche in particular, although uh, it's in Kierkegaard as well, but the, the idea that some of the values that we live, Nietzsche addresses this in the genealogies and uh, in the various texts that we've read, that, you know, we, as, we ascribe and celebrate the values that we live in as if they're eternal values, 
when in fact they're really just historically developed, right? They, these are the ones we were born into. So because they're close and we know them, we celebrate them, but that's their only, their only claim to authority is that they're close and we know them. And, and, and as a matter of fact, they be, they're so close and we know them so well that we can't even seem to get out of them. So the, the problem of historical value that we see in Nietzsche becomes a, a really, really important issue for Heidegger. So, all right. So there's a couple of things. I, I'm trying to situate Heidegger a little bit here vis-a-vis uh, -vis those predecessors that are called existential. Um, and one really can't put too much emphasis on, on these relationships. So I'm just not doing a, a fair job at them. Um, there's a lot to be said for the Kierkegaard-Heidegger relationship and even more to be said for the, the Heidegger-Nietzsche relationship. Well, even more, I don't know, um, at least the same amount. But Heidegger himself makes, makes his relationship to Nietzsche uh, essential. Um, one, there's a point at which Heidegger stops in his, in his like, sort of thinking and says, you know, we can't really go much further until we understand what Nietzsche. You know, we can't go further until we understand Nietzsche. And then he, then he does like this series of courses on Nietzsche that result in that. These are uh, what Nietzsche's, Heidegger's Nietzsche course notes, lecture notes, right? For his courses on Nietzsche, two volumes. Uh, volume one and two about uh, Nietzsche, a bunch of different things. Um, volume three and four, almost completely on Nietzsche's nihilism. Not almost completely, but a whole lot. A whole lot. So, I mean, there's eight, there's 600 pages, something you didn't have a... a anyway, um, Nietzsche's nihilism. Now, I have said something like that Nietzsche's not a nihilist. Uh, he says something like that. He This transvaluation of values, you know, he's... Nihilism is a is an, another dogmatism as far as Heidegger, I mean, as far as Nietzsche is concerned. So Nietzsche doesn't want to consider himself as a nihilist. However, Heidegger understands him as a nihilist, but not in that sense that is the contemporary sense of nihilism, where nihilism is really just an excuse for he, for hedonism, right? That's that's not. That's not nihil that's not real nihilism. That's the, an adolescent nihilism. You know, that's it. Somebody wants to live a hedonistic life and has found like a justification for doing so. A nihilist does not look for justification for doing something, right? So you know that somebody would use nihilate uh, nihilism as a as a justification for living a certain way would be non nihilistic. You know. And so, and Nietzsche's is always like growth and, and uh, augmentation of life power. He is not about um, nihilism in the, because uh, it's not that look, there's no such thing as meaning, but I'm just constantly making it. You know, in my life is, is meaning now and now. So uh, nihilism is for, is for one people who who want to have an answer in advance or are looking for a reason to justify a certain way of life, you know, uh, but nevertheless, uh, so there's a more complicated sense of nihilism and then there's nihilism that is the adolescent sense. Um, of course, I would suggest that Heidegger is understanding Nietzsche's nihilism in the more complicated way as that transvaluation of values. But that's like, and one of the things that he finds it's not so much that, that Heidegger understands Nietzsche's nihilism as meaning nothing matters. I, I think he puts it, uh, he does put it this way in, in like um, what is called thinking, the lectures, what is called thinking is that um, it made everything possible. Anything is possible. That, so it's not like there's nothing meaningful, but anything is possible. And that's the thing that, that Heidegger's like, got to try to figure out. This is what the thing that has made him focus on nihilism, right? That if there is no measure, then will is the measure. All right, so uh, this time around, what I want to do is I want to talk about Heidegger in terms of phenomenology. 
uh, Heidegger takes himself to be a phenomenologist. Like he'd say something like, I'm not an existentialist, I'm a phenomenologist. But it's this phenomenology that makes Heidegger be counted as an existentialist by those who aren't him, right? You know, it's because of his phenomenology that he would even be confused with an existentialist, uh, even if he wants to separate himself out from those people that call themselves existentialists. Because phenomenology is, well, in some ways, a, a kindred spirit to uh, existentialism. I say something like this, that uh, existentialism sort of comes to its fullest expression in phenomenology. Existentialism comes to its fullest responsibility in phenomenology, right? So, uh, but that's another point. We can discuss that some other time. Uh, phenomenology is an attending to lived experience. So it is always about or starts with what's happening right here in my lived engagement with the world, which is like what existentialism starts with, right? So this is why they are kindred spirits are talking about much the same thing. Phenomenology is something like a, a more rigorous method where we don't find this sort of rigorous method in Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. Um, we will find it in the phenomenologists. There's two elements to this phenomenological method that are, that are uh, important to understand here. They come from Husserl, and I'm telling you, if there was somebody in, in the 20th century that is vying for the most important philosopher title, uh, in, in contra Heidegger, it's this guy, Edmund Husserl. The, he's Heidegger's teacher, right? And there's a, like a long history with them. I, I mean, it's important history between the two because, well, Husserl's a Jew and Heidegger's an anti-Semite. He's a Nazi, right? So um, I don't know if you know anything about that history, but Nazis and Jews don't, you know, aren't usually on the same page, certainly not in 1930s Germany. Okay, so um, this is a problem. Uh, we'll talk about it. More can be made about it or maybe less. Uh, I leave it on your plate to figure out. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, Husserl, this, the father of contemporary phenomenology, uh, has this student named Heidegger, and he, and he takes a lot from his teacher, and in particular, two things. This, there's the phenomenological reduction, or the, it's, it's also understood in terms of the, the bracketing of the natural attitude. The natural attitude is what you'll hear in, in the literature, it's, it's Husserl's word, uh, Heidegger will use it, others use it. It's probably a misnomer because uh, natural attitude makes it seem like, the name makes it seem like the, the attitude that's the, the one that's first and, and closest. Like nature, my natural condition would be the one that's first and closest to me or something like that, right? But that's not, the natural attitude actually names the scientific attitude. So it's better to understand it maybe as the naturalistic attitude. And the naturalistic attitude is something like this. When we go to question ourselves or the world, we have, we have a tendency to, because of our history, certainly that's the case for Heidegger, because of our history, we have a tendency to take a, a scientific point of view or an, a, a, an abstract point of view, and we leave lived experience for a point of view on lived experience that is sort of disconnected from it. So reflection is sort of like a looking at the nature of the world or the nature of myself or the nature of whatever from the point of view that is outside of it, looking in. And then it's just all objects that I can understand the relationships between. So the naturalistic attitude assumes a sort of a point of view that is a, a, an a non-engaging point of view, sometimes called the God's eye view, the point of view from nowhere, the, the surveilling point of view from above, you know, one that just sort of looks down and sees even myself and the world splayed out in front of me, such that I can understand, okay, so that's, a, that's like a, a, just an inorganic body, and that's an organic body, and then I can understand the relationships between organic bodies and inorganic bodies, and I do so from the point of view of never being one. So the natural attitude is like 
unnatural in the sense that it's, it takes the point of view that is one that we don't live. And we start to talk about the nature of reality and what's true and real and good and right from a point of view that isn't even lived. We see this in Nietzsche's critique of, of Copernicus and Boscovich and Darwin and other scientists. <clears throat> but so there's something like of, of an overlap here. The phenomenologists, certainly Husserl and maybe to a lesser degree Heidegger, are less concerned about dismissing the sciences. Husserl wants to reground the sciences. Heidegger, um, science does its own thing, let it do its own thing. Uh, we have philosophy. So um, neither one of us is, uh, is trying to throw science under the bus, but just awaken us, us to the fact that we are not first and foremost things that engage a world in a scientific way. You know, as a matter of fact, we engage the world in an anti-scientific way in the sense that I'm in it. It's me, first and foremost. The phenomenologist takes, takes this stance. This is the zero point of orientation. All experience is, is mine. I, I mean, it doesn't mean this. It's not like a solipsism, like I'm the only thing that has experience. But I never experienced the world from a from a point of view other than the one that I have. I don't experience the world from, from your point of view. If I did, I'd be standing in you, right? I'd be you looking at me or something like that. So I, it's it's it starts with the origin and the locus of experience, which is self. <clears throat> now, so. The bracketing, the phenomenological reduction, is a shifting from perspective from that sort of naturalistic, objective point of view to a sort of first-person point of view. It's not merely first-person because it's not just I, myself, only, like maybe Descartes, but it's from here that any other experience happens. Is there a group experience? No. There's... Me having an experience of group experience, all right? Groups don't experience. Uh, I do. We don't experience. I have an experience of us. So, I mean, it's always like from here, but that doesn't mean that it's, it begins and ends like all in here. Okay. So the phenomenological reduction takes us to the point of view of lived experience. The next point that we need to understand is intentionality. And this is another word that just has like, I, it just brings up the wrong connotation, right? Because intentionality makes it sound like something that I've done on purpose. Like I, I intend to do X and here I go, I'm doing it. That's, well, that might be what intending means or something, but intentionality is not quite so willful. Intentionality is... Like the is like a, a an engagement of meaning, and that engagement of meaning is always accompanied by the thing that is meant, right? So intentionality is supposed to step out of the subject object relationship. Typically, in the naturalistic attitude, there is the knowing thing in the world. Right There's the human understanding and then the natural understanding. These things are different. There's the subjective and the objective, right? These are never the twain shall meet and all of that. And what, what, what Husserl and phenomenology try to do is say something like this. That is, that is an abstract point of view. That is not how we are in the world. I don't walk around my world thinking, I wonder if this is a true world. I wonder if that's really ground underneath my feet now while I take that next step. I wonder if that ground is still underneath my feet now while I take my next step. Since I, am, I, I can't be sure of the world and everything is subjective and the world is completely different than me, I'm still not sure if there's ground underneath my feet. No one lives that way. This is like a Cartesian understanding of the nature of walking where every step is a judgment of consciousness, right? I don't walk through life judging my life like this. Like, is this real? Is this real? Is this real? Is this real? No. 
Milliponti says it best, I live my life as if the premises are already given in advance. You know, as if the conclusions were already given. I don't make judgments. I don't make conclusions. I don't draw conclusions. I live in a world as if that's already done. I just move right through it. So, there is not a subject that, that lives in a world that's completely different from it, that's an object. Intentionality is something like this. That, that power that would be called subjective is a power into the world. And the world that would be called objective is the world giving back to my power, right? So in lived experience, there is not first me, world, separated. In lived experience, me, world, is a unity. It, it, it's not two different things. It's only two things for reflection, for that naturalistic reflection, for phenomenological reflection. Self and world is, is a unity. Subject object is a unity. Intentional intentionality, which is like a, a meaning into the world, is one side of meaning. It's not it's not at all like an idealist kind of thing where uh, consciousness is a power. It intends meaning and it just places it on the world as if there's nothing coming back. That's, that's wrong. For phenomenology, there is no subject-object because the thing subject-object, the thing that would be broken down into subject-object is first and foremost a unity. Okay? So this is the kind of thing that we want to, we want to get at. And, and the, when I say first and foremost is a unity, our lived experience is first and foremost a unity. For the scientific reflection, I need to try to fit together a whole bunch of separate bits into a unity, right? The scientist, the scientist understands my perception is happening according to like mechanical, like, stimuli that make things fire and then come up to my head and go bip and I have to try to make sense of all of these continuous bips into my head and somehow assemble them together into a unity and then say oh world right that the problem with the scientific point of view is that it it breaks up the original unity of lived experience the one that you just have right now it's right here as close to you as your own breath it's Scientific reflection says, well, this can't be how we're, it can't be how we're experiencing it. Because if we, if we think about the world in terms of how we experience it scientifically, you know, we might go run amok and, and, and sneak in some human, uh, what, uh, assumptions that don't belong in understanding truth. So what they do is they break up the human, the, the, our original unity with the world, our original engagement, and then try to reassemble it. They try to reassemble it from little tiny, tiny bits, like dot and dot and dot and dot and dot, bit, 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 stimulus, 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 nerve firing, nerve firing, nerve firing, nerve firing. But a unity, the unity of lived experience is not a judgment made from a whole bunch of disparate tiny bits. I don't look at the world and say, oh, oh, I think this is all one thing. I judge it to be so. It's already given as that. It's already given as one thing. 